Hello, welcome back to I Got Board Game. I Got Board Game. I Got Board Game. Friday. It's Friday. I'm Ben. I'm John. And today we are here to do a preview video of a game that is going to be up for pre-orders, I believe in March. So not there yet, but details have come out from the publisher. The publisher is Stonemeyer Games, and you maybe have... If you've been watching board game videos and stuff, you might have heard of this coming out soon. And so the game we will be previewing today is... The growth <laughs> of the red stock market. Hey, that's it good. Grows. That's Sports clever. Rising. <laughs> the red is rising. <laughs> the game yeah, is red rising. <laughs> it looks more like that, John's background now. And so Red Rising, actually, and we'll show more pictures of this later that uh, I've been able to get from the Stonemeyer Games website. And so it's all from there. The game is based off of the book, Red Rising, which I just started reading because of this game by mm -hmm. Pierce Brown. And it's designed by Jamie Stegmeyer and Alexander Schmidt. And so to go into the game, we'll give you first a brief idea of how it plays. And then we'll kind of share our thoughts on what sticks out to us about it. And in the end, we'll kind of do a little summary of our final thoughts on what we are expecting or hoping from the game. Mm -hmm. And so to get over to how the game plays, let me pull up a picture from the rule book of the game setup. And so I will share that. There you go. So this is like a rough picture, obviously from the rule book, not exactly how the components look, but the way the game plays is it plays, it says one to six players. Mm -hmm. So there will be an automum mode for one player, but one to six players and the idea of the game is you're in this red rising world and the world itself from the books is basically this dystopian world which has different classes of citizens all classified by a certain color and so you have a bunch of colors as you can see in john's background like all those kind of colors those different classes rankings for all the people from red being the lowest to gold being the highest and so, as you can tell from the title of the book, Red Rising, there's this idea of a red probably rising up against this, the way the structure in society is set up. Oh, what was the uh, thing from Hunger Games? Is this <laughs> yeah, it, the, the book actually does seem to be compared to Hunger Games and those kind of modern dystopian stories. But yeah, so that's kind of the theme, it has all these different classes. And so in the game though, the way that plays out is you're in this setting of uh, working on these different planets, basically uh, colonies in space. And you have those different locations on the board and you're gonna be dealt a hand of cards. And the cards are these characters from this, from this book, from this world that then belong to these different classes, which then also relate to their different job types, which you'll see later when we show pictures of some of the cards. But then with your hands of cards, every card will have a character and that character will have a point amount that they're worth if you have them in your hand at the end of the game. And then they also have a ability when you deploy them or basically play them onto one of the locations on your turn. And then they also have maybe ways to get you more points basically bonus points or even penalties if you have them in your hand at the end of the game in combination with some other cards or characters in your hand at that point. Mm -hmm. But then on your turn, you're gonna choose a card from your hand or randomly from the deck, I believe, and deploy them to one of these, I think it's actually just three locations or four. Four, four locations. Oh yeah, yeah, Jupiter, yeah. Jupiter, Mars, uh, yeah, Luna. Oh yeah, it's written up here. Jupiter, Mars, Luna, the moon and the academy is that what it is the institute 
The Institute, yeah. Come on, man. Right. And so one of the interesting mechanisms in the game is on your turn, when you're deploying a character to one of these locations, the card you play will then activate the ability on the card itself. Mm -hmm. And actually, let me just see if I have an example of that. Or we'll get to that. But basically, yeah, the main ability on the card. And so it could be an ability that, you know, gives you a certain resource. Like these red tokens in the middle are helium, which is in this world what's being mined as a valuable resource. And so it, maybe the card will give you a helium and that's worth points at the end of the game. Or it might help you move cards around these locations or move you up on this fleet track or let you put one of your influence tokens on this instance institute area up here which is also worth points at the end and so when you deploy the character you'll do their ability and then you'll have to choose a character from a different location different from where you deployed and take that into your hand and when you take that character into your hand that's when you actually activate the ability of the location they're on yep. and so you have the institute which is related to putting your influence tokens up here you have jupiter which is related to moving yourself up on this fleet track. Mm -hmm. And you have Mars, which then lets you get helium. And do you remember what Luna was? Luna is the sovereign token. Oh yeah, the sovereign token, which is like kind of kind of a not really a first player token, but it is kind of a token that lets you activate. Kind of like a king of the hill almost. Mm -hmm. when I think about it. It's it, it's uh, I think here in the rules it says like it, it's kind of like you're the leader. But mm -hmm. it, it's you definitely like there's certain cards that you gain bonuses if you mm -hmm. have the leader token or the sovereign token, or if you've already had it and you may be able to use it for different things. So, or take it from other players. So, yeah, I, I, yeah. And I remember as you can see here, there's these cards in front of the players, and those are dealt out in the beginning. Those are your house cards. Mm -hmm. So, belonging to a certain house will then give you a certain ability when you gain the sovereign token usually or, yeah, or other things yeah yeah and so and so yeah so that's kind of your turn you'll deploy a card that's a technical term i think they use and when you deploy it you have to take a card back into your hand from somewhere else and activate yeah. that location and one other quick thing on that is you can either do it by taking it from one of the locations shown or there's a deck of cards in the middle you can also draw a card just straight from the deck and then there's actually a die that you roll that could potentially give you a benefit that's oh yeah that's right that's right you don't play from the deck you would be able to draw from it draw from the deck yeah that's right that's right mm -hmm. and so and so yeah that's your turn and players will go around doing this until one of two end game triggers happen one is one player there's these three basic tracks we mentioned the fleet track this institute uh influence area and collecting helium mm -hmm. so once one player has completed or reached the seven spot on two of these three locations so basically seven you collected seven helium moved your fleet marker up to the seventh spot or i believe yeah putting seven influence seven. on the institute if you complete two of those three then that ends the game right triggers again. Yeah. where then the other end game trigger is among all the players collectively all three of these have been accomplished so yeah. someone has reached seven on the fleet track someone has put seven in influence here and someone has gathered seven helium mm -hmm. and so then that's the end of the game and you'll count up your points and so you have points based off of how far you got on the fleet track there are point amounts under there it's kind mm -hmm. of a different range it's not just incrementally uh for the institute basically the person who has the most influence there gets a certain number of points and then i think second place gets a certain number of points mm -hmm. and then helium each helium you have is worth three points and so those are how the those three places those three locations are scored but then the main part is then also scoring the points on the cards you're holding at the end of the game right all these characters you've collected and so, like I mentioned, each card will have its own points and then also either rules to get bonus points or penalties, depending on if you have other characters uh, in your hand too, which then is supposed to thematically relate to the relationships among these characters in the actual book. And so, yeah, that's the general idea of how the game plays. 
And so we'll get into our thoughts on kind of the things that just stuck out to us with this. If John, you want to start and I can kind of yeah. show some other pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as, as kind of Ben is going through it, uh, it seems like a pretty interesting game. It seems like a pretty fun kind of way of playing. It's a, it's a different take on Euro style games, I would say, right? Like, so obviously the point of this game is to collect the most points and gain the most victory points at the end uh of it but it's very unique because there's a lot of different ways of gaining points and it's a pretty varied system on how you get it right so there's as we mentioned there's three open kind of public kind of ways of scoring points that are like you can obviously see it on the board where you can see how far players moved on the on the pilot track you can see how many you know cubes they have in the institute whether you're going to rank in there or it's just literally you've collected more resources and that's worth you know just a strict amount of points at the end but then then there being an additional layer of secret points that everyone is kind of collecting as they're playing the cards which i think is really cool because in a lot of game a lot of euro games there tends to be like secret goals that people secret or hidden agenda goals that people are aiming for and in this game rather than it being like a singular card that you're playing with and trying to achieve that particular goal by the end of the game it's actually the set of cards that you're playing with from your hand right so it's in a sense kind of using the characters and the influence if you use other game terms like coup or resistance and stuff like you're kind of using this political influence or kind of activities of these characters and relationships to actually make points and your hands are secret. So while people will see what you're picking up and dropping off over the course of the game, how you're gonna score at the end of the game is still kind of secretive in that way, which makes it a very kind of interesting way of how you're kind of building up, not just playing cards in your hand to do things during the game to further yourself, but also what cards do you need to keep in your hand for the end game? Because you that's where you actually score the crux of a lot of the points at the end of the game. Yeah, I, I do want to point out like mechanically, I think, yeah, the most interesting thing or the thing that stuck out to me like from the start when I heard about this game was this idea of playing a card and then taking a card into your hand, mm -hmm. right? Which uh, I think some other videos I've seen people do uh, maybe know like an older game that does this, but I've never, I don't think I've ever come across that mechanic before. Uh, in, in this kind of meaningful way, right? It's obviously different where it's like, oh, you're playing a card and then you draw a card from a deck, right? To refill your hand. But it's really set up to make you strategize and plan of like, I'm gonna play this character here because I want their ability, right? So I'm gonna play this character and maybe it doesn't matter really where I play, but I wanna make sure not to play in a place that I wanna take a character so that one, I get that character, which then has its own ability that maybe I could use later, or it I can activate the location that they're actually at currently, mm -hmm. right? And so there's that those aspects of the planning. There's also the planning of like, maybe you know somehow that your opponent wants this certain character card that's out there or the ability of that location. So maybe you wanna cover it up with the card that isn't as good for your opponent or just basically blocking the card that they could take. Because if it wasn't clear from how we explained it too, these cards are on these locations in order, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that you play a card and then you choose another location and take any card there. You have to take the card on top there. Yeah. So the order matters. Mm -hmm. And so even putting a character on top of another character blocks someone from getting that character until later, right? Maybe mm -hmm. they do something later. And so, yeah, it has those different aspects to just that single action, right? Playing and taking from somewhere else that then you can start considering how useful your the action is, right? Is this character someone I want? Is this location an ability I want right now? Is it what someone else wants? And then how do my cards actually combo with each other or do I just want their ability right now? And I, and I think that's also kind of the really clever thing about again never read the book so not exactly sure what the whole theme of the story is or the series but i think this game being a euro game actually adds in the political element of like social deduction style games or like social games where kind of politicking and kind of determining what factions you need to part be a part of is kind of brought into the game without making it a heavy like actual social discussion game 
or kind of like one of those political style games because as we we're as ben was just explaining it there it's like there is a lot of intrigue about how you need to be playing your cards because again as you were saying right like maybe there's a card that you want to play in your hand that's like i want the ability i want to be able to use this active activatable ability by playing it but if you play it maybe it's like the second or the third of that color or that faction that you played and you know that maybe your opponent has been collecting those cards over time which means you're you in a sense you almost know that you're feeding them points for the mm. end of the game right but then you know conversely there's also the thing of well if they're only hoarding a bunch of these cards and by the end of like they still have to trigger the end of the game <laughs> right so are they actually getting cards that are worthwhile for the strategy to play right so there's a lot of this kind of thinking not just about your own play style but what you do on the board does affect how other people are going to play right and i think that's the other really cool thing about this mechanically as a euro game is that a lot of euro games tend to be kind of self-focused in, in gameplay and maybe there's a little bit of like touching or affecting other players in certain games but for the most part a lot of euro style games tend to be very singular or like a uh, player focus like only on your own board only on what you do to make your strategy work whereas in this game the things that you play or the things that you put into place will affect other players and what other players play out and do pretty significantly and heavily affect the kinds of things that you might want to do go forward right like for example maybe there is a like as as ben was saying right like when you're trying to take cards from a particular planet in order for you to get the benefit of picking up that planet if that planet has no faction or it has no cards on it there's no character cards on there you can't pick up a card from that place which means that you don't get the benefit from that anymore so if that's something that you're looking forward to and other players catch on in a way they could tacitly kind of work together and never place cards there so you'll never gain the benefit from that place for example or conversely you do the do that to another player right or as you said like stack it up with a bunch of useless cards or like a bunch of character cards where it's just like i don't really want to pick up any of these people yeah and i think i think the for people who haven't read the book which i mean i wouldn't say i have i just started it <laughs> Uh, I am looking forward to how that theme comes through, right? Like, I feel like actually from the little bit I've started reading, the book actually seems kind of like a darker setting than what this looks like. Like, this is more kind of a bright, kind of even kind of cartoony in a little way, right? Kind of animation style or drawing style, where I feel like the book is more like what Hunger Games might be like, you know, kind of like has like the clean utopia part but like overall it's like a gritty kind of struggling to get by kind of a movie uh and so that's at least the sense i got so far which is different from the art but i really do like the art but what i was getting at is i do look forward to yeah this theme coming through of seeing you know how maybe the reds the red characters have a certain you know way of getting points, right? And maybe the green characters have more of a similar ability. Not the same. I don't think the abilities repeat themselves. Nope. Not, but, the, not the factions, not the unique players. Yeah, um, yeah. And they're, they're in the and we didn't say this yet, but uh, here's a picture of the components. So there's actually about 120 cards in this game. Uh, and we're actually not sure if the characters repeat. Uh, we were guessing they might, because that's a lot of unique characters to do that. But we also have seen pictures of like multiple different characters for a given color. So there could still be a lot in each color, but it's just kind of, I think it's interesting to, yeah, learn how they maybe have similar abilities within a certain faction. And so when you see someone take one red and then another, and then, you know, they took maybe Darrow, who's like the main character who I believe maybe wants to be with certain reds, you're like, oh you're trying to get those points aren't you right like and i feel like even for people who haven't read the book uh they can pick on pick up on that pretty quickly right like after a few plays you'll maybe see certain cards and you'll be like oh you took that one are you actually going to be going for those points and collecting the other cards that that needs maybe uh, i don't that, think it'd be maybe. too hard to kind of learn those things yeah but it is intriguing like yeah again the theme i think is uh, I'm looking forward to, but then also component wise. 
So like I'm showing here a picture of what the collector's edition comes with. Uh, I am set on getting the collector's edition because the retail version, which I did not save a picture of because it's not even that nice looking. <laughs> but the collector's edition has this custom insert, as you can see, which is nice. I like those in games where the retail version will just kind of be two wells for all the components to go in, which is kind of not as nice, Crazy. obviously. <laughs> and then, yeah, you have you have like you'll actually have a plastic cover over the whole thing to keep everything in place. But then also these different markers in the retail version, I think are just like the clear acrylic kind of uh, yeah. components. But then in the collector's edition, they're metal. Mm -hmm. And then you, and then the collector's edition also comes with these card stands, which if we go over here. The colored card stands, yep. I think that's pretty interesting. Like that, that's a component that usually doesn't come with games, but it could be for people uh, kind of a quality of life thing, you know, that I don't just have to keep holding my cards. Uh, and that just really depends on who's playing and yeah, what they prefer. But I think it's nice that they include it because they can include it in all these different colors too, to add mm -hmm. to the color of the game. So component wise, I am excited about like, the nice production because of Stonemaier games, but then the color and the art that they've added to this world to give people a way to visualize this this world, this book. Mm -hmm. And so then actually to maybe get into some more of the details of the components and other things that might interest us about the game, I'm gonna actually share pictures of the cards now that I've been <laughs> mentioning a while back. And so the cards will then allow us to talk more about those abilities. Uh, let me see. Mm. Let me just get to the right window that I have open. Uh, I hope I have the right windows open. Window open. Window closed. Okay, window. okay. Here we go. So basically the pictures I am gonna be showing now are examples of cards from each class or each color mm. and so you have blues here which you can see are pilots in this world and then down here is where you have the ability of the card when they're deployed to a location when you play them onto a spot and then the top left actually is the points that the card itself is worth if you have it in your hand at the end of the game and then the bottom is what we mentioned, the bonus points or penalty that you get if you have the other cards listed there in your hand at the end of the game. And something nice about how they've designed the cards too is on the left side here, mm -hmm. you have images of the cards that they combo with at the bottom. So basically the side is a pictorial representation of how to get the bonus at the bottom, mm -hmm. which John pointed out before we started this video, but it is smart, right? It's a it's a good way to design it so that there's this other kind of reference mm -hmm. and that it's an image reference, right? That it's so you have the word explanation, but then, you know, maybe once you get more used to the game, you can easily just look at the image on the side and know what to go for with that card. Yeah, I didn't know if you want to say anything on that or it just mm -hmm. took your point. <laughs> oh, no, I was going to say it's just really nice. Um, I was only, well, there's there's some rule clarification things, but we can save that for a review of this game in the future. Mm. And so, yeah, so other other pictures you have, whoops, whoops, going back. back you have up. rounds. <laughs> mm -hmm. I hope none of this is offensive to you, you guys watching, but I'm... That's how I'm going to refer to them. By it just says on the card. That, that's just what yes, the card is. And that's that's how they're referred to in the world, too, as like reds, like dirty reds. Or <laughs> I'm not saving you from that one. <laughs> <laughs> reds are the lowest in the society. So that's why mm. people would look down on them. Mm. But yeah, you have browns here, which apparently are assistants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you have coppers. 
and, and just a quick note on the image. I know Ben had mentioned the image. You even have some like the coloring, right? Like it's not just the character pictures, but sometimes it's even just the color bar. So you know that mm. they're good with a particular, you know, faction, right? Mm -hmm. Or like a sorry, color, not faction, a particular color in mm -hmm. the world mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. and like the thing I I mean, we've been kind of talking about that I do want to emphasize is the multi-use of the cards right mm -hmm. which i think is something that's still great to see in when games do it right it is definitely more common nowadays but you know there's still ways to do it well right where then in this case you have the cards that again are worth the points in the top possible more points on the bottom but then also their own ability and then they also belong to a certain class or faction right and so, yeah, just these different details on the card that can all come into play. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, you have here the golds, which are the top class in society, the elites. Well, as we're talking about that, even then, I actually think it's a really cool, unique mechanic of the whole bottom area of like the additional point scoring. Because in a lot of games, generally, when they have these kind of like faction matching or color matching types of styles of points, it tends to be very like, oh, if you have X amount, then you just get X points. But mm. in this game, each card actually has a distinct value mm. based on how they interact or how they work with other cards, which is actually pretty unique and it's pretty different, right? A lot of like, not very, very many games have like the cards themselves having such varied amounts of points based on who they may be with or who they, they may not be with, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's also something I wanted to note, right? Y yeah, and actually I do have something to say about that too, but small comment first. In the collector's edition, the golds will actually have, if you can maybe see it in the image here. This oh, the far left of, one too. Yeah, yeah, this gilding, this basically yeah. gold etching in the cards. And so specifically the golds will have that, which I think is a nice, it's a very nice touch. It just makes them seem that much more elite. <laughs> and, elite class. and better than everyone. <laughs> But yeah, actually, but even with what you were just saying mechanically, I think even a step back from that, right? Like a lot of uh, what we would call set collection games, right? Trying to collect sets of cards for the most points. Like most of them are kind of, they have cards that do either or, right? That they are a flat amount of points if you just have it, or they combo if you get enough of that card, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's nice, yeah, that they these cards are functioning in both ways right they have their set points and can be worth basically uh, uh more points if you have a set and so you have grays here which are like security apparently mm -hmm. uh and then also i think another thing is it's the idea that you that your points are what you're holding at the end of the game i think it's so interesting right because what's very common with set collection games is you're playing cards into the space in front of you often called your tableau right just your collection of cards in front of you and then you'll count up what's there at the end of the game but this comes down all to your hand management you end up. right which cards are you going to play which cards are you hoping to get back in your hand if you played it or hmm. which other cards do you want in your hand instead or and don't want in your hand. yeah or cards you don't want and then there's also ways to in basically get more cards because there is like i think mm -hmm. uh i think there's actually technically no hand limit but yes. there are cards that let you get more because if you think about it on your turn you're playing a card and grabbing a card normally yes. and so your hand size will always stay the same so there are certain cards that let you get more cards you know when you're playing maybe you'll get one back from location and the ability of the initial card lets you draw another card or something like that so you can increase your hand size and basically then have more cards to work with but then even though there's no hand limit i believe there is a kind of a penalty yes that like after you reach a certain limit of cards and go over it each card after is worth like minus 10 points minus or something 10. yeah so, so, so I, make sure that it is worth more to you at the end than yeah. how much you're losing for it so so and for example even on the card that ben is showing right now on the far left one the online gambler it looks like i think is the name the mm. Greek programmer uh, their power or, or the bottom power, I don't know exactly what it is, um, but basically it allows you to gain cards of that particular color. 
You mm. just gain a bunch of those cards. Oh, and yeah, yeah. Just Name just one non gold color, reveal seven cards from the top of the deck, and gain and all so, the cards so of that color. In that way, you could draw a hand and have a bunch more cards in your hand that are not of the right color right or of a particular color and you could have a bunch of cards but as ben said i believe you can only score up to seven cards and anything beyond seven no matter what is worth minus 10 per card over seven mm -hmm. so you could have minus whatever amount right it, it's technically unlimited because if you mm -hmm. have that many cards mm -hmm. so and then actually the card that you pointed out too is I think I believe the way this ability on the bottom is read is also that it's it's an I'm guessing it's an end game ability. Mm -hmm. So it would just trigger the once at the end of the game. And so that's why it seems different. It has a different icon than these mm -hmm. victory point symbols that we've been seeing, right? Mm -hmm. Because all of these are more that straightforward what we've been describing of getting more points if, for example, you have Violet in your hand with this character also exactly with a violet sorry i thought that was a name but a violet because that is one of the classes <laughs> and if you use the imaging on the left of the card yeah. no, it's true I like color it's true i'm a noob <laughs> <laughs> yes that's very helpful <laughs> uh good but yeah design. but good job I, so I, <laughs> and designers and you have obsidians here which are assassins mm -hmm. You have orange here. I think these are pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, and going back to my point too, the mechanic of like what you're holding on at the end of the game. I've, I've played a couple games like that, but I think that's always kind of clever where it comes down to, again, not what you're playing out so everyone can see in a sense what you're getting, but in a sense what you're secretly building up in your hand is actually your tableau and what you're getting points for. I, th I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so yeah orange engineers and you have pink companions i was telling john i actually really like the art of these pinks <laughs> he loves the left one <laughs> no you suck. Left you suck. One. <laughs> that guy looks like a, a punk I, I would punch this guy <laughs> well you know companion probably stands for another uh, word of course of course so that's my like, favorite I, I, is the left one. No, my favorite is the right one, <laughs> Calliope. <laughs> I think her color scheme is really cool. And then I don't get why this girl, Evie, I'm guessing, has wings. I didn't think that would be part of this dystopian world. But maybe I'll learn who she is in the book because she yeah, has they something all used getting to have points wings. with Darrow. So related to the main character in some way. But not with Mickey. But not with Mickey. <laughs> Turn, probably turns down Mickey for Darrow, but she's a quote unquote companion, which is probably not a good thing for Darrow to have. Mm -hmm. Married man. <laughs> and we have reds with a yellow here, but this is just a picture from Sunmire Games. But the reds, Darrow, the main character of the of the book of the series, mm -hmm. and Ao, his wife, and, and an he uncle. has a companion. <laughs> no. tisk, tisk. wife wife <laughs> and silvers financiers in this society nice. and you have the violet artists Zanzibar. wow 31 more points of each of your cards is a different color Gotta paint that 4D, yo. <laughs> All about the rainbow. <laughs> and you have the white arbitrator. Nice. But yeah, I mean, I think like, yeah, the art is great. Like not just even the color coding, but you know, this white in the characters' backgrounds have like this really brightness, bright look to it, right? Uh, it's yeah, really nice. Yellow. Yellow. Not um, to be mixed with gold. Yeah, not to be mixed with gold, not the elites, but doctors. <laughs> mm -hmm. Doctor, doctor. And the surgeon, the surgeon is getting five points for each gold you have. So probably a surgeon to the golds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And yeah, so the, that's a look at all the different colors. And again, we mentioned that it looks like from one of the gameplay videos we've seen that there are more than just like these three yellows. Yeah. Like there are probably a, f a couple more at least. And so that's why we're not quite sure if cards are repeated or not. But it might be some of the names were kind of generic and, and some of those like surgeon was kind of mm -hmm. yeah 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 so maybe there's might... like a second surgeon card right so there might be more than one in some of these factions but i'm sure some like the named characters are probably unique mm -hmm. like, yeah like, that would make sense one, there's that probably only sense. one darrow probably one only one eo mm. there's probably 15 quicksilver no just kidding <laughs> <laughs> So. And so with that, that is kind of our thoughts on like some of the mechanics, hopefully explaining them in a way that's helpful for you to imagine how they would go and how the game would flow. But to kind of end this, we kind of wanted to do a little, uh, yeah, final thoughts on what we're hoping or expecting from this game. John? So I'd say to, to, to final thoughts here, I think it looks like a really fun game. I think there's a lot of opportunities for some pretty interesting things you can do given the way that the powers work because or like given the ways that the cards interact with what you need to do in the game so i, th I think as we talked about in the rules it's a pretty simple game in terms of actions there's really not a lot you're going to be doing in the sense of like you don't have to decide on like i'm going to do this action this turn with these things and this way right it's really just you either play cards or you draw cards right that's pretty much all you're doing um but even that like just the simple placing the card in a particular location or where you're picking up cards from which card you want to pick up are you picking it up because you want the power from the planet or is it the actual character card you want right is it going to set you up for success or you know is it actually going to set you know your opponents up because maybe there's a card you reveal there's a lot of like pieces of intrigue that make this kind of game, which again, you know, I've, I've said it a few times being a Euro style game, I think really adds a lot of complexity to, which makes it something that I think could be played a lot and regularly. And it's a pretty simple game to pick up. Like, I think there was a lot of text, it seems like, but really most of that text isn't that crazy. A lot of it is just basically telling you exactly how to use the cards, right? It's pretty clear about what you're supposed to do or not supposed to do with them. So also in that vein, I actually think that this is a game that if you're interested in picking it up, you could probably play it with any group of people that you think of, uh, that, that you want to play with. Like it wouldn't take too much to really learn or just get into and dive right into as a game. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited for this game. I mean, it's not like a big Stonemaier game, like Scythe or Viticulture mm -hmm. or tapestry their most recent one but i believe since it's by them it will have this kind of uh quality to it to both the production but then also how it feels when you're actually playing it and the, for the feel itself in not being a big box game from them i i do agree with john that it'll be like this game that isn't too hard for anyone to pick up like i kind of would think of it as in the same level or weight as maybe Azul and those kind of games, maybe a little more going on, but more because of what the game allows you to do, but not because it's hard to learn, you know? Like mm -hmm. to get in, it won't be hard, but then to do well, then I can actually imagine some pretty exciting moments uh, throughout the game where, you know, your own plan will kind of be going up and down. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll be part of the excitement where, it won't be like a traditional Euro where you're just always building upward in some way, right? Mm -hmm. But I can imagine you're gonna need to switch up your plans pretty quickly at times, right? Where at some point you'll be like, oh, okay, I have like these cards that might combo together and maybe I'm missing one that can maybe help it combo better. But then, oh, but then I see that maybe that could help me more. So I'm gonna junk some of these to get that and switch over my plan. And so I, I think that might be an exciting part too during the game, just the constant kind of up and down of your, your hand and plan changing. And then hopefully coming out with a good plan in hand by the end when the game ends. So yeah, I'm excited for it. I, I definitely want to try it with a bunch of people since mm -hmm. it seems easy to get into. Uh, and it and has not, six players. 
Yeah, that's and that's great cool. too. Yeah, that kind of player count to be able to do do a game like this, which which I think is also cool because even though the game sounds like it can kind of change really quickly, then I think it might not be too bad feeling uh, when playing with more players, right? Because that's always that's often the concern, right? With certain games, it's like two players, it's really tight because we know what we can do back and forth. But then when you have like up to four or five players, then it becomes too random. Or then I feel like in this game, it already has a bit of that randomness already because of the playing and taking and constantly shifting the the player, the board state. And so I think having more players might not really make it that much different. So that would be great too. And then just a little bit, I'm excited to hopefully read more of the book when I have time and then get more of the theme from the game when I get to play it. And then one other random tidbit that I want to let you know uh, from reading and listening to some of the videos and stuff that good scores can reach to the upwards into the 300s. So if you do end up getting this game and playing and you know you get to your end game score, 300 seems to be kind of a breaking point of like, you did really well in the game so <laughs> yeah, you know that's, that. that's all i'm going to be aiming for when i play <laughs> and yeah i know that there's a score pad in the game so <laughs> it's not a thing you have to worry about counting yourself <laughs> so that score pad to help with that uh but yeah and some of the videos john and i have been mentioning right we did i did kind of suggest a couple to john before this to get an idea of the game and so i would suggest to you guys if you found this game interesting what we've been talking about to check out maybe the the how to play video by watch it played and rodney smith he actually obviously received a copy of the game to set up a how to play video so those would be the complete rules for the game if you're curious and then before you play with monique and naveen they have an actual gameplay of the of the game so if you're curious you could also see how it actually plays with them too but aside from that if you found this video helpful, interesting. I hope you'll consider subscribing and following on Instagram at I got board game and hope you'll share this with people you play board games with friends, family, and until next time, we'll see you then. Bye.